So I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. George Hamilton. Thank you very much. And we have you down for possible management options. So possible there management you office. Go. Yeah, it's gonna be a it's gonna be a really short presentation. So yeah, I'm gonna talk about spotted lanternfly management. This is new for me. I'm the guy that talks about brown marmorated stink bug for the last 14 years. Now I have something new to talk about. So as you've already heard from Ann, this is an imported insect from Asia. Uh, got into Pennsylvania on stone material in 2014. Uh, as she said, it's been detected in Delaware, New Jersey, and Virginia. Uh, it's a fulgord, which here in New Jersey is a group of leaf hoppers that we do have, but they're considerably smaller and they're not as pretty as this one, and they don't do a whole lot of damage that I'm aware of. As Ann said, they have sucking mouth parts, and as you've already heard, that's one of the problems with this. They have sucking mouth parts, which means that they feed on phloem material from the trees. They're actually able to insert those mouth parts into the bark, take out material, and because of the way they feed, as Ann said, they have lots and lots of fluid in their system, and they have to get rid of that, and that's what creates some of the problems that we have with this insect in terms of the sooty mold and the fungi and so forth. Uh, again, you can't see this very well, but something that's very common with invasive species, they come here without their natural enemies, and that's one of the problems. And that allows them to do what we call ecological release, because there's nothing there naturally that is keeping them under control. And we are seeing this with spotted lanternfly over in Pennsylvania. And so what I've got here is just a couple of pictures. This is a tree in somebody's backyard. You can see the little play toy right there. And the whole trunk is just covered with spotted lanternfly adults. And the same here in this picture over here. Um, as Ann said, it has a fairly large host range. Right now, we've heard a lot about the cultivated grapes, a little bit about tree fruit. Ann did mention that it does feed on a couple of hardwood species. And Tree of Heaven, which as Ann said, is everywhere. Just drive along 78, coming over from Allentown, and it's on both sides of the roads for just about every mile, okay? It's, it likes disturbed areas. It lights lots of different areas, like growing wild inside my greenhouse on campus. And one of the problems with it is it's very difficult to get rid of. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about how we, how we might be able to do that. And in terms of preference, this is one of the trees that the adults prefer. Okay, um, gonna be much too small for you to see, unfortunately. But this is just a listing of the tree species. I figure that since we were dealing here with nurseries and landscapes, we better talk a little bit more about some of the trees you might have in a landscape. Um, again, and I can't see it myself from over here, but it has things like birch trees on there. It's got hemlock on there. They feed on pines. They feed on oak. They feed on maple. They feed on um, black walnut. In terms of the fruit, they feed on apricots, peaches, apples, cherries, and, and, and whatnot. And, and um, even willow is in this list. So there is a lot of different things that they can feed on. Doesn't mean that they will be on those. And it may only mean that they'll be there temporarily during the growing season. Because like a lot of other hemiptera, and brown marmorated does the same thing, there's only a few hosts that they can spend their whole life cycle on. The rest of the hosts that they feed on, they have to move around at different times of the year because there's something missing from that plant they're currently feeding on, and then they move someplace else to find it, okay? I can't tell you what that is yet with the spotted lanternfly. I don't think anybody knows. But we know with, say, something like the stink bugs, um, which can also feed through the bark of trees. Nobody knew that until a few years ago. Um, they're following the maturation of the seed pods or the fruit on the tree. That's pretty much what they're following. So it'll, we'll see what happens with, um, with this critter. Um, the main management program I'm going to talk about is actually what the Department of Ag in Pennsylvania has been doing. And they have an active campaign over there trying to get people 
to do the kinds of things that they want them to do. And we need to be thinking about this because I doubt there's anything out there right now that, and if, we, if we'd heard about it, we would have already, uh, in terms of natural enemies that feed on this thing, okay? Now maybe there are, and maybe we'll find some, but right now I don't think that's the, the case. So if you have a property that has a lot of tree of heaven, in the borders around the nursery or around the vineyard and whatnot. What I would suggest you do, and this is what the Department of Ag is suggesting, is that you cut those trees down, okay? Now, we don't want you to cut all of them down. We only want you to cut down 90%. That's because we want to leave a few trap trees, okay? Things that if they're in the area, they will come to. And let's say if you have 100 Alanthus on your property and you cut down 90, 10 trees is a lot easier to manage than, it, than 100 trees, okay? It'll concentrate them, and they're having some success with this over in, in Pennsylvania. Now, one of the things that you're going to need to do is treat the stumps unless you're going to dig them out. Has anybody ever tried to dig out the stumps of an Alanthus tree? It's next to impossible because they have all these runners. You just keep pulling and pulling and pulling, and you keep finding connections to more and more trees. So if you're going to cut them down, you're going to have to treat them. Uh, there are a couple of materials that are recommended. Uh, and again, dicamba is one of them. Amazapir is one of them. Triclopyr and glyphosate or Roundup. Okay, Those are some of the herbicides that you can do. And again, uh, we want 10% of those trees left so that if they're there, they'll concentrate on those trees. And then the recommendation is to spray them with dinotefuran. Okay, it's one of the neonicotinoid materials. Um, it, what, you, but what you need to do is make sure you use a formulation that has um, ornamentals on the, 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 the labels, okay? That'll keep us legal. We're allowed to do that as long as what we're gonna treat is there the pest doesn't necessarily have to be there, okay? So we can, we can do that. And again, spray 10% of those trees when the um, insects are there. And the, the other reason they're recommending dinotefuran is it's systemic. So it'll get picked up and transferred all through the tree and it'll last uh, longer than a topical application. Now, if you have a site that doesn't have any tree of heaven, you're not completely out of luck if you have it there. There are some other things that you can do. Um, again, the primary thing is that only spray the trees if spotted lanternfly is present, okay? The last thing we want everybody to do is go out and start spraying all the trees. It's, it, if they're not there, it's not going to do any good, okay? Because I doubt we have something that's going to be around long enough um, to serve as a residual type of of application. So if they're there, uh, you can use, again, an insecticide labeled for use on ornamentals or the specific tree species that you're treating. Now, I'm not sure how many of you have looked at ornamental labels, but if you're in landscape business or you're a nursery, you have. And you know, sometimes they're very general and sometimes they're very specific in terms of what you can treat with that material. But if you're in, got the right tree species or ornamentals, you should be fine. And again, you know, if you're gonna do this, follow all the label directions, okay? Especially if you're gonna use the dinotefuran materials. Anne alluded to this uh, a little bit. Um, it's bee toxicity, okay? And your neonicotinoid materials now have special labeling. They've got that new warning symbol, the diamond with the honeybee in the middle of it. And just because you're not growing something that may be flowering, there are th statements on labels with the neonicotinoids that impact you. And they're related to what might be growing or flowering in the ground cover underneath the trees. Okay, so we have to be very careful with that. Yes? The dinotepharon, are you talking about spraying the foliage or are you doing a bark spray? It would probably be best if you did a tree injection spray or you did a root injection spray you know, application, okay? That way you get it right into the tree. Um, I believe dinotefuran does have some 
s systemic action will go in through the trunk and the, and the lease, but the better way to do it is to actually inject it. And I think that's what APHIS people are... Yeah, they're doing bark sprays? Oh, they're not doing... Okay, so the bark sprays work, I guess, okay then. Good. Okay. Um, so let's see. What, are we, what can we do? Okay, so contacts materials uh, by Fenthrin is one of the things that the Department of Ag in Pennsylvania is recommending, um, and Carbaroller 7 is the other material that they are recommending over there. Uh, in terms of the systemics, I've already said dinotefuran and imidacloprid are the two um, materials. Now, we've always got to have an option these days for people that can't spray. So we do have organic vineyards, so I threw this in. Um, neem oil is something that can be used, and uh, insecticidal soaps are something that can be used. But they're going to have to be OMRI certified for you to be able to use that. So we do have those options. Okay, um, some things that um, Ann actually alluded to. Um, Non-chemical things, remove the egg masses. This is actually one of the things Pennsylvania is telling the people there to do. Um, if you see the egg masses, scrape them off into a plastic bag and then double bag it and dispose of it uh, so that those eggs can't, won't hatch and the materials get out of there. Or if you want to, um, and this is probably going to be really hard to do based on what I've seen of the, the egg masses, uh, put the eggs in alcohol or hand sanitizer. The alcohol, the, the sanitizer will kill the eggs is another way to go. Probably the easiest is to, is to scrape them off and bag them. Okay. Um, you can put them in your garbage. Yeah. You, yeah, I, I got to make sure that, my, that my, you know, the guy from the Department of Ag agrees with me. But yeah, that's why you double bag it to try and you know, make sure they don't get out. The egg masses? Ooh. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I wouldn't use bifenthrin, okay? Because there are, there are restrictions on using pyrethroids in terms of blanket spraying the sides of buildings and houses and whatnot, but I don't believe there are any of those for carbaryl, okay? So don't use the bifenthrin, all right? Um, now, th this is going to be something probably very similar if you've ever been through one of the major gypsy moth outbreaks where there's egg masses and cocoons and everything all over houses and whatnot, and people scrape them off, power wash them off, if they can, uh, you know, I'm not going to say get on a ladder and uh, scrape them off. Uh, if it was me, I'd hire somebody to do it. I wouldn't do it myself. Okay. Um, information. I thought I'd throw this all in, um, but fortunately, you've got most of this where these websites go to on your seats already, okay, which is good. And they, have, they had them as you came in the door. Um, the, New Jersey Department of Agriculture has got a website. Uh, you can go, and they've got a map there that shows where they've had some detections, the ones that Joe was just talking about. Department of Ag's got websites. Um, so does the, us, and gave talked about that one. The Penn State Extension does, and of course, USDA has, has their own materials. Um, all of those materials have slightly different information in terms of the things they cover which is great, so if you have them all, you've probably got most of the knowledge we know about this thing, okay? So if you didn't get any of these back there, go ahead and pick that up. And Ann talked about reporting a sighting. I'm gonna talk about this as well. Uh, the New Jersey Spotted Lanternfly Hotline, Bad Bug Zero, I think that's a great one, easy, one, easy way to remember that. Um, if you do call that, leave your name, how you can be contacted and a little bit about where you're finding them and so forth so they, they, they know where to go and who to contact about that. And then the website, you can do the same thing. Um, if you can take a picture, you, you can upload it to that website, send that uh, as well to that email address as well. Right, Joe? That's what it says on your website. 
Right. Yep. Yeah, just be aware that when you do that, they are going to come and probably look because that's the only way we can verify that it's actually spotted um, lanternfly. That's one of the reasons why with the samples going around, Anne's really serious about wanting to get them back because we don't want people walking around and they did this with Asian longhorn beetle, which meant I couldn't get a sample to show people. They're afraid that somebody will pick it up, take it someplace else and say, hey, look what I found here. And all of a sudden we're in another state or another part of the state. Um, and that has consequences if they find those things. Okay, questions? Yes? Did you say it needed another host? Did I understand you correct? It needed another host to complete its development? Is that what you said beside those trees you mentioned? Uh, what Aunt, both Dr. Nielsen and I have said is, is that Atlantis right now and grapes are the only ones that we're fairly sure they can complete a full development on. Okay? Everything else, they will feed on it, but they're going to have to switch around to other types of things, yeah. And, and that's very common in Hemiptera. Oh, it was on a slide and I forgot. I'm sorry. How many of you remember tree banding with gypsy moth? Put the sticky things around? Well, the Department of Ag, that's another non-chemical thing that they can do. Um, and they are recommending over there, you put the bands around the trees, and as they walk over it, they get stuck on it, and then you can take it off and dispose of it. And I think their website says they've collected 1.2 million of these things using the banding. So it works, okay? It's something you can use at your home. It's something you can tell your neighbors to do if you get it in your area. And um, they are available. Yeah, well, I don't know from nurseries, but you probably can get them in some of the big garden centers. Is wild grape not a host? Yeah, we just, okay, so we just worry about the vineyards. Yeah, yeah. So one of the problems we have, because it's not in the state, we can't actually bring it in to work with unless we have a quarantine laboratory. And we don't have one. You can't even work with it at, at the Alampi facility. Yeah. Yeah. We don't have the right levels of quarantine. Once it gets here, we can do all kinds of things with it. And um, our blueberry cranberry entomologist is already thinking about seeing if it'll feed on this, on his two crops. So, yeah, we're concerned about that. Yes. Y yes. Yeah, Ann. Yeah, Ann has been over there. She's been talking with the people over there, Department of Ag and, and whatnot. That whole eDNA thing that, that she was talking about, that's been being done in collaboration with the Department of Ag. In fact, they're hoping to get some funding to, to get that all figured out from the Department of Ag over there. And then I'll come back here. Yeah. As far as I know, I've not seen anything about things naturally that are feeding on them here. That wasp wasn't feeding on the insect itself. It was, it was feeding on the, the fluid coming out of the wound. We see the same thing when the stink bug feeds on thin bark trees. You'll get the wasp coming and they're, they're after that fluid because it's high in sugar in the fall. In fact, that, one of the things that I would like to do, if we get it here, this is a pitch for those of you that have nurseries, one of the things we did with the brown marmorated stink bug, they did this down in Florida, was to do surveys of the trees that were being grown at the nursery, and then they looked at the lineage to see how much of it was from Asia, whether it was a, a plant native to the United States and whatnot, and tried to track feeding preferences based on that. So that would, if once it, if it does get here, that and gets into a nursery, that might be something we could we could do. Okay. Yes. Uh, 
Okay, let me try and take the first one. I'm going to say that it's probably too early to know, okay? Um, because I don't, well, it hasn't been here long enough, and I'm not sure it's been in, you know, Korea, South Korea and whatnot long enough for them to get to a point where they can go through cycles. So usually what you see is a period of, of rapid expansion, which is, you know, what it, we saw it with the stink bug. We've seen it with spotted wing um, uh, Drosophila. And we're probably going to see that with this. And then at some point, things will level out, and then we'll see periodic outbreaks. That would be my guess. Um, so with, and I, I, by example, I'll say with the brown marmorated, um, over in Japan, where it is a problem, it's only a periodic problem now. It, it bust and boom, okay? And if you've noticed, here in the east, we actually, in a lot of places, including New Jersey, have lower populations. They've been declining since 2010, 2011. Although we've had some mild winters, so we may start to see them come back. But so far, it hasn't happened. <laughs> 